A science has proven smiling is contagious, quite literally. When we smile to others, they are likely to smile back. Our brains can't help but reciprocate the kind gesture. And with a big rush of endorphins, we all start feeling good. But what about those with crooked teeth who resist smiling, who aren't confident, who hate the way they look? Especially kids and teens. Being young these days is hard enough without being embarrassed by a less than perfect smile. So today we're talking about an organization dedicated to making the world a happier place one smile at a time. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Ortho Thrive. Today we have Jeff Bean joining us. Jeff serves as Vice President for Smile for a Lifetime, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide free orthodontic care to underprivileged kids and teens. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, talking with us right before Turkey Day. I really appreciate that. I was, uh, I was mentioning earlier that uh, my whole house smells like turkey t- uh, today because we, we, uh, like to hang out with each other and not be cooking on on turkey day so um, that's a good idea <laughs> yeah, so today t- today is an exercise in self-control well that's good because then you just let go the next day so it's kind of like it evens out certainly do although i may practice having a nap this afternoon I, I yeah that's a good call <laughs> you got to prepare the systems <laughs> yeah absolutely so why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background who you are what you do how'd you get here sure yeah, what the heck are you doing here? Um, so I I have a, a pretty deep and long history now working with the orthodontic profession. Um, I have uh, several different companies actually, all that uh, work with orthodontists. Some of them have orthodontists as partners. Uh, some of them have orthodontists as clients. The, the, my main company is a company called Vision Trust Communications. And um, we're probably best known for our video um, content uh, related to ortho. Uh, A few years ago, we had a a campaign that uh, went viral in the little in the little pond of orthodontics uh, about choosing a specialist for orthodontic treatment. Um, That makes sense. That's important. Yeah, it's pretty fun. And actually, uh, we used humor to to deliver a a strong message. Um, I also have a lot of nonprofit. Uh, experience and and uh, a real passion for um, having a bottom line that's not just financial, but that uh, hopefully you know leaves things a little better than uh, we found them, yeah. uh, makes makes the world a better place. So I'm actually uh, I founded a, a nonprofit organization called Vision Trust International, okay. uh, which works with uh, it does confuse a lot of people, uh, and that organization uh, works with orphan uh, children in. I think we're in 14 different countries now, actually. Uh, started that in 1997. And, um, and I have a personal philosophy. I want to be involved in, uh, in some form of philanthropy or, uh, or service, uh, internationally, nationally, and then locally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Smile for a Lifetime is, uh, is it's, it's actually an international organization. We're also in Canada. Okay, um, cool. So it is in North America, but I think of that as the as the national organization that I'm really involved with and committed to. Um, and the international one is Vision Trust International, and then I do a lot of different things locally. Great. All right. So tell us a little bit about Smile for a Lifetime. People have never heard of it. Sure. Um, I I should have probably done a little research. So this this will be uh, right from the right from the old bean. Perfect. Um, <laughs> Uh, Smile for Lifetime, I, I believe, actually launched officially in 2008. Mm. Uh, it was the uh, it was the brainchild uh, of a fairly well known orthodontist named Ben Burris. Okay. Um, so Ben actually started this uh, this engine, and uh, in an interesting, I, I've always found it interesting. Ben started it, um, but he set up a board where he wasn't the president. He was never really that involved in it. Uh, as oh, I recall, so he just had a great idea and he put it in the hands of people. You made it happen. And, and, and the funny. idea was, was born out of the notion, a notion that I definitely agree with. I think Ben said it to me this way. And I know he was quoting someone else, but I can't recall whom. Uh, but the quote was, it's good to do good while you're doing good. 
uh, oh. in other words, you know, <laughs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> right? That is nice. Uh, this and, means financially and, and then doing good for the world. Yeah. So it's good to do well while you're doing good. Uh, yeah. But uh, but uh, he said it the other way, and I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, and I don't think I've ever met an orthodontist. You probably haven't either, who doesn't give some form of pro bono work as a part of what they do. Yeah, that's true. Um, there were uh, two other organizations, I think, already in existence uh, that were uh, similar, certainly categorically similar. Uh, one is Smiles Change Lives. And then the other is one called Donated Orthodontic Services, uh, uh, or, or DOS or DOS. It always makes me think of uh, the old computers. Like, uh, Yes, I prompt? remember that. I don't know yeah. if many people do. I know, age, sorry. I think, well, but... there's that <laughs> um we, uh, we originally had uh, the notion that Smile for a Lifetime would, uh, <clears throat> would occupy kind of a different niche in that it would be uh, offered kind of on a market exclusive basis, um, okay. meaning one doctor per market area, because uh, there was a recognition that um, philanthropy can be an important part of building a really robust brand. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and so that was that was originally part of the design. That's actually changed. And um, uh, in a few minutes here, I'd love to tell you how it's changed and why. Um, but uh, in its early years, it was um, it actually was a pay to play. The doctor would actually pay an annual fee yeah. to smile for a lifetime in order to then give away free services to patients. That must have been um, an interesting pitch. <laughs> an interesting <laughs> proposition, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, and the primary reason I think most of them did it was they were already doing some form of pro bono. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to build kind of a, a brand or strategic marketing advantage. And, uh, you know, we, we had some, uh, some missed starts early on. Um, we've changed the model now to... Uh, there is no pay to play. The doctors yeah, can be providers for a smile for a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot more of the services uh, are now managed uh, centrally um, that used to be managed at the, at the local level with each office. But one of the key differences in smile for a lifetime from the onset was that uh, we recommended then, and we still recommend today that they build a local support group. Uh, that gets beyond just the dental community and involves school administrators, church leaders, yeah. uh, people who have access to kids um, and actually involve them as, as local advisors or a local board um, to work in helping you uh, grow that part of your business. That's a good idea. I mean, people are dealing with the kids directly. Do you help the doctors through that kind of step-by-step step, what to do? Help we do. And in fact, in the new model today, we, we in the old model, uh, originally, it was that local board that would vet candidates for treatment. Uh, so kids would put in a, a, an application. They would have to get a couple of uh, letters of recommendation from teachers or uh, leaders in the community. Yeah. Uh, and then that local board, along with our doctors, would decide who gets treatment. Um, that's a lot of work. And that's a lot of work. It does at the sound like level. a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I funny understand because- understand the reasoning behind it. Yeah, Richie, on one, on one hand, um, that local connection is incredibly valuable. Oh, absolutely. Um, on the other hand, it was really time consuming. So, uh, yeah, doctors, that, are, if I've learned anything about orthodontists, they're insanely busy. So I try not to absolutely. put extra things on their plate. But, absolutely. In many cases, awesome. it's a spouse that's on the board mm -hmm. uh, or, or a team member that, that's on point. Um, anyway, that, that was the old model. In, in the new model, we still recommend as much local connectivity as, as possible. Yeah. Um, a lot of them will have a local news media person on their, uh, on their advisory team. Um, so they get a lot of press coverage when that's the case. And, um, and the national organization helps the local doctors uh, kind of build that world for themselves in their local market. Gotcha. So when it when it first started, were there a lot of people involved in Smile for a Lifetime? Was it just a small little group? Yeah, when it first started, um, it grew pretty quickly. Uh, it grew to, I think, about 100 providers wow. um, in its first year. Uh, 
And in fact, I think a lot of that could be credited to, to uh, the fact that uh, the Shulman study group, I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, mm -hmm. that group. It's a, it's a well-established and very high-end, in fact, you had to have a pretty big practice to be a member of Shulman. Uh, Shulman practices all embraced this idea. They thought it was a great idea. And, uh, and so we ended up with about 100 members pretty quickly out of the show. Yeah, I mean, that's super, that's explosive growth for the first year of an idea. Yeah, I think. yeah it's pretty incredible. Um, at this point, the organization is, serves about 600 kids a year. Um, so that's uh, where it is now. That's a good yeah. amount of kids getting free braces or yeah. his line or treatment in general. It's pretty incredible. I, th I think the total value now since 2009 of, of donated services is pushing about 48 million. Uh, is it really in, 48 in, million? Yeah, awesome. in donated services. Yeah, very cool. One of the things that the national organization has done that I think is really cool and, uh, and a differentiator, I think, from the other options, not that the other options are bad at, at all. Um, the National Organization for Smile for a Lifetime has created actual partnerships with some pretty neat nonprofits like Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, yeah. Big Brothers and Big Sisters, um, Court Appointed Special Advocates, CASA, a, a really cool organization that helps kids whose parents are going through legal problems. Interesting. Um, and all of these orgs have a tendency to serve kids that just by nature of the socioeconomic status of their family are not likely going to benefit from orthodontic treatment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so, so for a lot of orthos, it's hard to find those kids because they're not in that, they're not in that neighborhood and they're not in that circle, mm -hmm. but they do want to make a difference in their community. Uh, and there's a real pay it forward um, aspect to what we do so that kids who do receive treatment are actually, in some cases, contractually agreeing to be involved in community service in their own community. That's so, interesting. My Rotary does a similar thing. We give away a scholarship to college students and they have to show their grades to us. They have to do a speech every year. Yeah. We we'll have to reciprocate a little bit. I think that's important. I think it makes a huge difference. And one of the cool things about my job is I get to take video crews out just about every year and um, meet and film interviews with kids who've uh, gone through the program or who are going through the program. Oh, that's fun. Uh, to find out not only how their smile changed, but how it has changed uh, their whole outlook on life. And, uh, you know, you can't work in and around ortho without knowing that a smile can really do that. Um, right. But a donated smile, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible how it can change these kids' lives. Really inspiring. Did you have any issues with your own smile when you were younger? I did. I, uh, any stories uh, about that? <laughs> in fact, um, I lived in a small town. There were only about 8,000 people in my town, and there was no orthodontist. Yeah. And I'm the fourth of four kids. And so all wow. of my siblings were treated by an orthodontist. Uh, but it was a two and a half hour drive to the orthodontist. Two and a half hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So by the time it was time for me to have braces and I definitely needed them, uh, my, my uh, arch looked a lot like the bow of a boat pulling into the, pulling into the dock. Um, yeah. Um, the, the local dentist in my town said, you know, I, I can do that. I, I've taken some courses. I, I can, uh, I can treat your, your son. So my parents jumped at the chance. So I had braces from a general dentist actually in, uh, and I was his very first orthodontic patient. Were you um, really? Yeah. Okay. So it's really funny that I, I've become so passionate about uh, the specialty, you know, all these years later, but I was in treatment for three and a half years. And um, my smile was, uh, as one orthodontist put it, my front porch looked good, uh, but, the back, but the back deck was a mess. Uh, yeah. I was actually, I was finished in crossfight. And so I lived until I was 50 years old um, with a smile that looked okay. Yeah. But, but a bite that really was off. Oh, wow. And, uh, and I had a lot of issues with it. So I was treated again at the age okay. of 50. Um, wow. There's nothing wrong with, with that. With braces. And I'll tell you what, I, I've uh, enjoyed going to the dentist ever since because my, uh, my occlusion and, and crowding having been dealt with, uh, uh are no longer problems and uh, that's great yeah i'm a i'm a huge fan on a personal level 
So, I mean, what do you think, it, how difficult is it for kids nowadays? It feels like bullying and shaming have just increased, which is a terrible shame, but uh, yep. I mean, it seems like it's become more and more important these days, this smile and how much it affects their lives. It's a great question. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, I get to meet these kids and find out uh, the kinds of difference that having ortho has made for them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wish, in fact, if you want, I'll send you some links. I'd love for you to see some of those stories. And uh, you might even be able to incorporate them into the into the podcast. But Oh, yeah, we'll um, put them in the resources section so everyone yeah. watching can uh, see them for sure. Well, a lot of them are online, so that's great. Um, there's no question. Uh, bullying is a huge and, and common issue with the kids that end up applying for treatment. And... Um, the way I view it, Richie, uh, everyone with a smartphone is a publisher these days. Uh, <laughs> That's so, true. <laughs> so, so imagine that bully at school having the ability to, to broadcast or, or post online. Yeah, this um, makes it so much worse. And it's a very, very common story in the kids that, uh, that Smile for a Lifetime ends up treating or the doctors uh, who, who are providers for Smile for a Lifetime end up treating. It's really cool to see the difference it makes. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think COVID has uh, had any effect on all of this? You know, I, I can't even Maybe the difficult gonna... of parents being able to even be able to afford, obviously, orthodontic care. Uh, there's no question that uh, many people will, will qualify based on their 2020 financials um, who might not have qualified in previous years. Uh, oh, you're actually the, yeah. you're the first person to ask me that question. I hadn't even thought about it. Yeah. Um, we have seen a significant increase in applications, though, as this year has progressed, and uh, and I'm and they do have to provide proof that that they can't afford treatment on their own um, by providing a tax return and and some other financials. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, I've been well, seeing I, how the food bank lines are getting huge in some places, and the irony uh, is because the restaurants are shutting down there's a surplus of food to send to the food bank. So there actually is plenty of food, but there's a huge yeah. increased need for it. So I suppose that's, there's any silver lining. I guess, there. I guess that's a silver lining. You know, I live in Colorado and yeah. in Colorado until this year, uh, a restaurant couldn't donate their food that was uh, expiring. Well, that's they, interesting. They were required to throw it away. And they actually passed new legislation that now makes it possible for them to donate it. Oh, that's um, smart. Seems like such a no-brainer, right? Yeah. Um, but the amount of food that was being thrown away was uh, was ridiculous. And it was it just had an expiration date on it. It wasn't that- Yeah, it, literally, it was nothing wrong with it. Uh, for I sure. totally I totally would have eaten it, you know, and, and I think anybody else would have. So I love that it's now able to go to shelters. Yeah, we um, subscribe to the Misfits where you get those vegetables that don't quite look right. But yeah. they're great. I love it. Who cares? They taste great. They, they taste healthy. fine. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so are a lot of doctors still participating despite the shutdowns in the program? How was you, what has that been like the last year? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, it's funny. We, we have sort of a, a minimum expectation. Um, and it's not a requirement, it's, it's just sort of a guideline that a doctor would treat um, four kids a year. Yeah. Uh, we have doctors treating uh, 24, 26. I think we had one doctor who treated uh, 50 kids in one year. Really? That's yeah. amazing. It's, it's a huge difference in the community. It's, it's incredible. And, um, and, and you better believe the community knows that about them too. So I, I think it's awesome. I, I do think that as a rule, we as humans have um, kind of one of two cuts, uh, those that say, what's the minimum I can do? And those that say, how much can I do? And, uh, you know, we have both kinds of doctors uh, uh, among our providers, and we are equally thankful for those that are doing the minimum because they're making a difference. Absolutely. Um, even, but I one, always, even one child, who knows what they could be? I mean, they could. There's a, there's an old uh, story, and I, I, I don't imagine that it was ever true, but it's often told like a true story, yeah. in the nonprofit world about a, a father and a son on a beach, and uh, and the, there were a, a lot of starfish that had had washed up on the beach and were, were dying, you know, because they were out of the water, and the son was 
throwing them back in the water one at a time. And it looked hopeless to the, to the father and the father said, why are, why are you doing that? You, you couldn't possibly make a difference. And he said, it makes a difference to this one. It makes a difference to this one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, exactly. Right. It's a great story. I, I've heard it in lots of different nonprofit spheres. And, uh, and you know, that one kid can make a huge difference uh, in the world. So uh, I don't think this is a small thing at all. I, I think it's awesome. Another really cool thing about doing it this way, dentists tend to, and dental specialists tend to mix, you know, together. They tend to be in their, in their own circle, their own uh, dental ghetto, I sometimes refer to it. That's and, interesting, and, yeah, I <laughs> that is true, okay. Meaning, um, for a specialist, quite often they'll be asked to treat a kid because a dentist asks them to treat a kid. You know, yeah, they know course. that it's a family with a need. Well, statistically speaking, we know that about 50% of the U.S. population doesn't even have a dentist. They don't know their dentist. Um, I didn't know that. It's, a 50, it's up to as high as 50%. It's, it's about 50%. Couldn't name their dentist. Uh, it's so weird to me because I'm such a tooth nerd. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that is the case. They, they don't regularly go to the dentist and they don't actually have a dentist. Um, they certainly have need because of that. And yeah. quite often these kids who have the greatest need are in families like that. Um, so getting beyond that dental ghetto, if you will, beyond the, the world where um, it's a kid who's clearly seeing a dentist or the dentist wouldn't know they had a need. Yeah. Um, I think there's real value in that for the community. And, um, and, uh, and I love that it brings that, that incredible value of dentistry quite often. Um, someone will apply for orthodontic treatment who doesn't have a dentist. Yeah. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, bet it, I'll bet it is that. 50% of the time. Yeah. And, and so we've encouraged all of our specialists um, to build a network of, of uh, referrers, GPs, uh, oral surgeons, barrios, um, who will also donate their, their time and their, and their services. So even though really, they may not great. actually, and that's really been a huge growth area for the organization. That makes a lot um, of sense. Just do the whole journey, of course. Yep. The last story we captured was in North Carolina was a, a 21 year old woman. And yeah. I'll send you, I'll send you a link to her video. Her story is incredible. She now works for an oral surgeon. Okay. Um, and she was a total phobic about uh, even going to the dentist. Um, the local hospital, a periodontist, a cosmetic dentist, and an orthodontist all pooled their talent and their resources to treat this young woman. She received over $40,000 worth of free treatment. Oh, which would never have happened in her life. Not in a million like, years, in, including yeah. the hospital donated the overnight stay uh, wow. for the surgery that she needed. And she had a genetic issue that was... Uh, she, she basically had, I think she had 13 teeth uh, on her own. Um, okay, wow. Her story is incredible. And, and she's making a huge difference in her community. And now she works at an oral surgery. Wow. Um, so it's pretty cool. And that was, just happens to be the last story we captured. Is there like one story that you think just like comes to mind as the greatest transformation of all these years? Hers is probably the greatest transformation. Um. I mean, forty thousand dollars worth of care. It must have been. It's pretty dramatic. Un unbelievable, yeah. And that—that's not the norm. But I think that that group of doctors are now. There's, there, I, I see them as being akin to soldiers who served together and fought in a battle together. They are friends for life. Yeah. Uh, and there's no question that anytime there's an interdisciplinary treatment that one of them needs help on, they're going to go to the other guys on it. And so they're going to help each other grow their business as well. But it, it came out of this, this battle uh, yeah. of treating this young lady. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So would you consider this a big differentiator for a practice participating in Small for a Lifetime? I think so. I, I think the, the, in fact, this is not official yet either. But when I talk to doctors about joining up, um, I think Smile for a Lifetime gives them the opportunity to do some pretty extraordinary things. So I've actually started saying, do something extraordinary. Um, because I, and, and you guys know this, I think, because of the nature of your work. I think when they have those kind of extraordinary stories and they take on a tough case, um, 
it can transform their image in their local community um, and make them appear to be extraordinary as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I agree. And, and there's nothing fake about it. You know, it, it's not a marketing initiative. It's yeah, you're real. not giving away a car. You're not, right. <laughs> I mean, right. It's totally different. It's, just, it's, not, a, it's not a Visa gift card. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So I think that's a huge differentiator. I also think that the, the partnerships with those national organizations that I mentioned um, provides a level of access uh, at a, at an, uh, in an area of the community that they don't often get to touch. Um, and I think that's transformative as well. So I think those are really two, two key differentiators. Are there other reasons you think doctors come to ask to participate that they have in their mind other than those? You know, um, people may not like hearing this, but um, I often say uh, orthodontics is kind of a, an industry of followers. And I, I don't really mean it as a slam. Yeah. Uh, wh what I mean is they do tend to follow each other's lead. Um, and that can be good. That can lead to really good things. Or, uh, or that can be more of the lemmings sort of uh, picture where everybody follows everybody off a cliff. <laughs> That's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the, and the profession has uh, um, stories of both kinds, uh, for sure. Yeah. I think, I think this is one of those areas where um, not only is it good for the individuals that participate, it's really good for the profession as well. So I have always believed that um, philanthropy is an important part of a of a well-rounded brand. Yeah. Um, and that you know that's just the marketing guy talking. Um, I mean, I think that's just if you're gonna you know be an ethical human being, it should be part of your thought right? process, I guess. Well, I, I'm with you there. I really am. <laughs> um, and and I think then if you can do it as a part of a national organization that is growing the profile uh, of the profession as a profession where philanthropy is key. Um, I think that's good for everybody. And, and so that's what Smile for Lifetime is, is attempting to do on a national basis. Oh, and so um, it's free for doctors now. Uh, all the applications are processed on, online. Um, they're all vetted uh, and essentially the doctor is presented with, you know, ready to go cases. Um, it makes a huge difference. So, you know, it, do it a does. lot of the groundwork I, for them. I really dragged my heels on making that change because um, I love the local board. I, I thought the idea of having those kinds of connections locally was just incredibly valuable. I, I, I mean, still if the doctor do. has the time and the inclination, I totally agree with you. It's just a matter of you know, this is the end justify the means. If it's not going to happen at all because you have to go through this, then which way is better? You know? But even now, and I think we have about uh, 280 providers now, I think is yeah. the current number. I asked the national uh, director, um, Robin Cohen, by the way, and, uh, and she's awesome. She's been a, a public servant her whole life and, and she's really passionate about this. Anyway, even with 280 providers, um, approximately, it might be, it might even be 300. It's over 250 practices. Um, That's great. And many of them, as you know, have multiple doctors. So, um, so yeah, you're making a huge difference. So if you guys, if this is free, how are you guys making any money? I mean, that's, yeah. so the, <laughs> that's okay to ask. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's great to ask because our original business plan was to charge the orthodontist and not to charge anything to the kids yeah, uh, and the families. And that really wasn't a sustainable business model. Uh, ultimately, gotcha. we, we knew that we had to change it. So we now charge a small application fee. And I wish I could tell you how much it was. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's very reasonable. I'm actually that not sure sense, if it's 20, 20 or $40. So there is an yeah. application fee. And then there's an administrative fee. It's not a treatment fee, but there is an administrative fee. So if a kid is, is in fact selected for treatment, yeah. um, they do have to pay a, a small administrative fee. It's a few hundred dollars. Um, they, it's very clear that the orthodontic services that are being provided are being provided 100% free of charge. Yeah. Uh, the doctors are not charging anything. They're not making anything from it. Um, and that administrative fee is, is what fuels the, the organization. That makes sense. That's that reasonable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of people who believe that if the patient or the patient family doesn't have any skin in the game at all, 
um, they're not going to be a good patient. I, I can tell you that I don't believe that that is universally true at all because we we've treated a lot of kids with zero um, cost to the kid. Yeah, we, we also have funds available so that if a kid can't afford that administrative fee and they get selected, yeah. we give them a scholarship. Oh, uh, great. So they so they don't end up paying anything at all. Just do it on a case um, by case basis. That makes sense. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. All right. So if a doctor wants to get involved, what do they do? What's the step to take? Right. So um, as I mentioned earlier, our our national director is a woman named Robin Cohen, mm -hmm. and uh, she can be reached at robin at smileforlifetime.org. Uh, you can also just visit smileforlifetime.org on the web. Yeah. And uh, all the contact information is there. Uh, I believe there's a link on the website that says become a provider that uh, will give you kind of all of the parameters of how it works. Yeah. Um, Can only doctors become involved at all? Is it just for, is there any other it, ways to be involved? It is, um, uh, uh, there is an opportunity for corporate sponsorship. So um, we okay. have a number of number of companies that, uh, that provide different levels of cash donation. And, and that cash goes uh, both to running the organization into those scholarships that I mentioned. Um, uh, people donate services as well. Uh, my company does that, uh, as a matter of fact. And um, uh, team members can get involved, but ultimately what we really are looking for is to grow the, the number of providers that we've got. Yeah, absolutely. E that makes even sense. with 250 practices, we have a few states where we don't have any doctors at all. And uh, I think we've got a waiting list of kids looking for doctors in a number of cities. Oh, do you uh, really? Yeah. And so the, the board of directors for Smile for Lifetime has a number of consultants on it and then a number of doctors. And uh, we will quite often pick up the phone and call somebody that we know if we've got a kid that needs treatment in a, in a particular town and say, hey, oh, that's it's time good. for you to become a provider. Yeah, exactly. So how does a family... Uh, request assistance that they're looking for. Same thing. Smileforlifetime.org is the website. And uh, there's a real clear path for applying for treatment. Um, and uh, and all the parameters are there as well. It, it does still require a, an application, uh, some letters of recommendation, some financial documents. Uh, again, that's all part of the vetting process. Um, you can talk to three orthodontists, you'll get five stories of uh, <laughs> of patients who, you know, asked for free treatment and, and, uh, drove away in their uh, Mercedes. So, uh, <laughs> Oh, really? Oh yeah. So that vetting process is very important. The vetting process really <laughs> is important. That makes sense. But I loved your question about this year, 2020, uh, and, and the impacts of COVID. Um, I think a lot of people are going to uh, be on the poverty under the poverty line for 2020 with their family income. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you're probably who, right. Who never were in that basket before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, boy, if you're an orthodontist in the audience or, or uh, any dentist or dental specialist um, and you have a heart for giving back, uh, boy, we would love for you to join the team because uh, I don't think there's ever been a time when, when the services that you offer could be more important or could make a bigger difference. Absolutely. I totally agree. We'll put all the links on our page. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us today. I really enjoyed learning more about Smile for a Lifetime. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And uh, I appreciate you uh, including us on the program. Absolutely. All right. Take it easy. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks much. When you're doing well, it's great to have a place to give back, an avenue to give back to your community. And I think Smile for a Lifetime is a good choice because they vet the people that are applying. They make the process very easy. It used to be a lot more difficult as far as the time and energy for the doctor, but it really is very simple right now. You just sign up with it. You make a few decisions and they ensure that it's done right. So if you want to make a difference, give Smile for a Lifetime a chance. Keep grinding, keep thriving, and I'll see you next time.